This is the BioCentury Show. The BioCentury Show is brought to you by Cytiva. From cell to tissue engineering, the frontier of advanced therapeutic medicinal products, or ATMPs, is vast and lacks a clear roadmap. Cytiva's expertise, technology, and services can help you navigate your ATMP journey for nucleic acids, viral vectors, cell therapies, LNPs, and more. While you master the science, we'll focus on fine-tuning your manufacturing to get you to your next milestone efficiently. Cytiva is part of Danaher, a global science and technology leader. Along with Danaher's diagnostic and life sciences businesses, Cytiva brings an innovative mindset to our collaborations with customers to help them improve patient outcomes. Hello, I'm Steve Usden, Washington editor of BioCentury. A big part of my job is to explain how government makes it easier or more difficult to turn science into medicine. Over the last two and a half decades, nothing has been more exciting than seeing how regulatory policy has catalyzed dramatic advances in cancer treatments. And no individual has had a bigger impact on shaping this new era in cancer than Dr. Richard Pastor, director of FDA's Oncology Center of Excellence. FDA has just celebrated his 25th year at the, at the agency, and I'm happy to have the chance to speak with him today. Before I do, I have to say, I just watched a one hour interview, a web um, interview that's on YouTube. I probably shouldn't do this, but after this, I think everybody should go and watch it. Dr. Pazder, it was set up as a celebration of Dr. Pazder's silver anniversary at FDA in a very typical fashion. Instead of using that time to talk about himself, he got four uh, former commissioners and the current commissioner uh, on the webcast, and he asked them. Um, a series of, of very interesting questions and um, and the things that they said were really interesting. So back to today. Dr. Pastor, I mentioned that no one's had a bigger impact on cancer care than you. I should add that no one has been as controversial either. I remember in your earlier early years at FDA, the Wall Street Journal, Journal's editorial board called you Dr. Death, and they ran editorials for years accusing you of killing patients by setting the approval bar for cancer drugs too high. But cancer drug development has surged under your watch from a low of 3% of approvals in 1985 to 40% in 2020. What changed? The science changed, okay? Uh, I, I think it's very important that we realize that approving drugs that don't work is in no one's benefit, okay, or have marginal benefits. Uh, and what we really saw was kind of a revolution of uh, the uh, way drugs uh, were being developed, uh, drugs were being discovered. We saw the advent of targeted therapies. We saw drugs that didn't have 10% response rates, but had 80% response rates. We saw the whole field of checkpoint inhibitors uh, come to be, so to speak. Uh, so there have been dramatic scientific improvements. And I think, Steve, this has an implication for the agency even today, because it's under a great deal of pressure you know, to approve drugs that are controversial that many people question. And sometimes you have to have the thick skin to say, no, they don't, despite the loudest voice in the room calling for their approval. So uh, I think that this lesson that we saw in oncology has over this 25 year period of time, where it went from drugs that were being uh, basically developed uh, that were traditional cytotoxic therapies with multiple negative uh, ODAC meetings with controversy surrounding their efficacy. And that didn't do anything if we just approved those drugs and uh, appeased the loudest voices in the well, room. Well, I want to I stop you there because it's not just as simple as the science changed. FDA changed also, and I think, and you changed it. I think that's important because when you first got there, the only way to get a cancer drug approved was to show a benefit in survival in two uh, large trials. And you changed that, and that enabled, that catalyzed these changes you're making. We wouldn't have precision medicine. We wouldn't, precision cancer drugs. We wouldn't have immunotherapies um, if we were using the same criteria for reviewing and approving um, cancer drugs as we've had in the past, but there's kind of like a cottage industry of academics still that criticize you for that uh, and say basically that we, that all that we should be doing looking at is um, overall survival. Can you talk about that a little bit about the but why you've changed, why FDA has changed the criteria for assessing 
cancer drugs and why that's important? Well, I start with the adage that the clinical trials are here to serve the patients. The patients are not here to serve the clinical trials, okay? And I think that's an important point. Uh, and the issue here is what is the information that one needs to approve a drug? Uh, is it possible even to do a randomized study with uh, a survival endpoint, which are usually large, large trials, so to speak. Uh, and, and there are many reasons why some somebody can't do that. Uh, number one, the size of the trial, the natural history of the disease may be long. Uh, the uh, history because of the therapies that we have approved may be long. For example, in multiple myeloma, where you have people living almost a decade from their original approval, it would be un un impractical to demand an overall survival be demonstrated. So it really became incumbent upon us really to take a look at what we were doing and not just following this cookie cutter uh, approach. Now, one has to also look at these issues of are these surrogate endpoints, and we've gotten away from that terminology when we discuss response rates or progression pre survival, and we kind of label them as uh, earlier clinical endpoints because they're really not true surrogates, okay? If at best they may be correlates, but nevertheless, they are in essence, benefits to the patients. If you go to a doctor and the tumor shrinks, so to speak, the doctor will say, you're getting benefit from this therapy. Uh, if your tumor is rapidly growing and uh, it's delayed and the benefit is of more stable disease, then that's a benefit to the patient. You know, when I practiced medicine, okay, for 25 years, uh, and people forget that, that I had another career before I came here, when somebody came in to the, uh, to the exam room and I saw them and I click, labeled it as a positive lipstick sign, you could see in their face that they had a benefit. I didn't need to take a look at that x-ray. And then when I flipped up the x-ray, I saw that their tumor had a market to, uh, or size reduction. So these are not just radiographic endpoints. They do have meaning for patients and that's how we actually practice uh, medical oncology. Yeah, for I those think that are on this cottage industry, I'd just like to use this tune from a line from the uh, group, the Black Eyed Peas. You're so late, you're so 1998, okay? <laughs> we have had so many discussions on this, as you know, okay, in ODAC meetings and other areas. And it seems like every couple of years, people want to reinvent this existing conversation. And then the price of uh, the price of these drugs also get embroiled in this whole discussion, which is obviously not in our bailiwick, so to speak. So, okay. so this gets to something else I want to ask you about, which is really kind of your philosophy of regulation, right? Because some people would have looked at the, the rule, the regulations, the way that FDA was doing it and said, you know, this, this, is, this is what the rule is. You look at the drug, you say, well, no, it didn't, you didn't do two trials that showed overall survival, so goodbye. What, what you've done, I think, is you've, you've looked and said, I, where can I imagine cancer going? Where can I imagine the, 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 the field going? And what do I have to do? What does FDA have to do to enable that to happen? Is, is that you know, the, the way that you look at it? I, I think it's an think accurate it? description. Uh, you know, I use this phrase in the interview that I did with the commissioners that uh, Peggy taught me, Peggy Hamburg taught me. And if you don't see the light, you soon feel the heat, so to speak. So you have to take a look at the picture, okay? When something has a high degree of activity, for example, say like the BRAF inhibitors and the MEK inhibitors in melanoma, uh, do you even need a randomized study there, although they were done, but it was obvious what was uh, happening there. And that was kind of the impetus of the whole concept of breakthrough therapy that emanated from that whole regulatory time there regarding the uh, an introduction of these drugs. Uh, of, we need to be a little more creative in what we're doing here. Uh, but here again, I, I think we really had to evaluate that this was not going to be uh, sustainable to have this very rigid regulatory environment. And this did require us to really bring in uh, the review staff. Uh, and I think this is an important issue that many people don't understand that has been 
I think one of my lasting legacies here is the staff that has stayed here uh, and have worked with me, okay? Uh, when we had uh, a recent celebration for this anniversary, several of the people said, oh, I really enjoy working for Dr. Pazder. And I had to correct them and say, you don't work for me, okay? You work with me, okay? And that's an important distinction that I think uh, effective leaders have to have and leaders here uh, in the agency also have to have if they're going to move the field forward they meet, need to move the staff with them and it doesn't occur in a specific drug discussion okay on a specific application but with the underlying science and the discussion of multiple applications of where you want to go with it and bringing in the community too because here again the staff in any regulatory agency became become somewhat uh, closed in to a monastery only, and you need to get them out into the real world to hear what people are doing and saying. So, so when you talk about also when you're talking about the staff, it, there's something that that has happened. There's a phenomenon that's happened um, in recent years several times where there have been center directors, people like you, who have overturned decisions that their whole the, the consensus of their whole staff made. Now, I was wondering, have you ever done that? And what do you think about that? In general, what kind of signal does it send to patients, to the public, to, to the staff at FDA? Well, it's problematic. And, and here again, I, I think one of the underlying things is, is working with the staff. Okay, people don't report to you. They should be working with you. And, and many of these discussions concerning an application, uh, really the groundwork of that should have been done through external meetings to discuss endpoints, to discuss where people are going with a particular uh, disease. And as you could see in oncology, we have multiple different scientific meetings that we host with the uh, with the various uh, professional groups, with patient groups, really to discuss endpoints. I think a perfect example of that is the recent ODAC we had on min minimal residual disease in multiple myeloma. That was not just one meeting, okay? That was the culmination of years of multiple meetings with the uh, with the community, with and the, independent of a particular application is a key thing. Independent right? of any application, and that groundwork needs to be uh, laid. Now, with regards to the management style, I have my own particular management style, uh, and it is more inclusive. Uh, I have not overruled staff for the most part. Uh, I can't think of anyone specifically. And, and many times I may not totally agree with something, okay, but I don't necessarily have to be the brightest crayon in the room, so to speak. I will take into other people's viewpoints and see a viewpoint uh, that I may not totally agree with, but understand where somebody is going with this. Uh, and I, I think that's important for a leader to, to deal with. When one is leading a large organization, one has to be very careful of where they step into a, a discussion and when they step into a discussion. After the reviews are completed, people have pretty much made up their mind. So if people want to have this interaction, they should be doing it very early on before the application again comes in. Uh, again, it can produce some uh, obvious consternation. And as you've seen, several people have left the agency because some of these uh, interactions. So that's quite unfortunate. But I, I think really the, the major issue is what applications and why, because here again, this could lead to just every time a company has a disagreeable discussion with a particular uh, review division that they just escalate it to the next level, to the next level, to the next level until they get a sympathetic ear. And, and that will just create a, a, a major chaos. So there really has to be a very good reason why somebody jumps into an application. And I well, think that it, should be few it, and far between. And speaking about sympathetic ears, there's something I've also I've always wondered about. So I've I've talked to CEOs of companies, and they've told me that when they run into problems, they've kind of boasted and said, "Well, I can I can get on the phone, and I can get the the center director, I can get the commissioner on the line um, to to straighten it out." You know, and I've always wondered what what is that like for the people who get straightened out? You know, what what are, what is the appropriateness 
of, of having those kinds of conversations where you have CEOs or corporate leaders talking to senior people at FDA who, who then are, are intervening in the process. Well, it's just common sense. It produces a sense of distrust, okay? And unlike most of the other center directors, if you call OCE a center, okay, I have been a division director, okay? I know what it's like to be on that other side of that conversation. And it produces obviously distrust, what is being said in those conversations. So I have uniformly stated, don't call me up regarding a, a specific application to pharmaceutical companies or CEOs. Okay, if you wanna have that conversation, I'll be happy to have it with you and with the review staff because applications come and go, Steve the relationship that one has with the review staff, with the divisions is there permanently. And that is far more important than a specific application. So you really wanna maintain a culture of inclusiveness and one that you recognize other people's opinions. And you don't do that by taking these ex parte communications. It just produces a, a sense of distrust. And I could say that because I have been on that opposite side uh, and most of these people have not been that are taking these conversations so one more um controversial question before the break okay. and, and then we'll come back to things a little bit fail to mention avatar rick here who oh, it, it, that that's that that um avatar back there um is a large cutout of rick that his staff gave him um as part of the celebrations of your um, silver anniversary there so here's so the I got that on ego manacle uh, <laughs> egomaniac here. There is it's, it's, it's your good angel looking over your shoulder. The 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 question I want to ask you before we go to the break, and then we'll come back and talk about some more things specific to cancer and uh, regulation, um, is about advisory committees. Um, as you know, there's a dispute about how they should function. Um, Commissioner Caliph has said that he believes that there should be fewer votes, there should be much more um, attention to um, the discussions. My understanding is you've publicly said, I've heard you publicly say that no, that you think that the votes are really essential. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, the critics and the analysis of the advisory committee uh, really have interviewed many people. They've interviewed patients, they've interviewed uh, the uh, members of ODAC, they've mem interviewed senior members of the FDA. Who have they not interviewed? The staff, the division. Who organizes these re, uh, these uh, ODACs? And what, makes decisions based on them. Who, that's it. Who, who, what is the purpose of the ODAC meeting or the advisory committee? It's to provide information to the, the division that is making the ultimate decision on this application or the, uh, the decision on this application. So I think that we've missed an important component in this whole analysis of the review divisions of let's bring in, and I'm just talking about the articles that uh, the journalists have written about this. They, they very rarely discuss what the opinions of the actual review division, and that's the whole purpose of the uh, advisory committee is to provide information to the review division. My feeling about the vote, uh, and here again, it, it uh, revolves around my own personal experience after ODACs or after advisory committees, is facing a meeting. Um, companies, if the decision is not in their favor, is not going to have a, uh, a, a amiable meeting with you, that's for sure. I labeled it as the uh, you know fire coming from a dragon's mouth, so to speak. Everybody has their own opinion regarding what was said at that meeting and what is the importance and who said this and who said that. And his decision and his uh, his opinion means more than somebody else's. Um, and if you don't have that vote, you're not going to get the clarity. And that's why I was uh, really adamant that for disease specific, where you really have to make a binary decision, uh, you really need to have a, a vote. Now, here again, I, I think it's important that when we do have discussions about scientific issues, that most of this is flushed out in other meetings, basically, that people have uh, outside of a ODAC meeting or a regulatory meeting, a, a, a advisory meeting. Uh, these advisory meetings, as you know, are very stylized. There's somebody taking down everybody's word here. There's 
there's all of this uh, formality that exists. It's not uh, ende uh, endears itself to a really good scientific discussion many times. And you see many times people grandstand at these meetings. This is not uncommon. So to have a really good scientific discussions, many times it's better to have these meetings and these discussions in other venues sponsored by professional groups. And then when one reaches a kind of consensus of where we're going, then take it to an advisory committee. But it should be a multi-step process rather than what well, we're just taking it to an advisory committee. Well, thanks. We have to take a quick break. We'll do that and we'll come back. And as I said, we'll talk about some things that are more specific to, to um, cancer regulation. Thanks. The BioCentury Show is supported by the BioCentury Conference Series. For three decades, BioCentury has helped biopharma executives and investors make business critical decisions and build larger networks with peers across the biopharma innovation ecosystem. Our goals are simple gather the right people in the room to partner, network, and debate critical issues facing the biotech industry. BioCentury's upcoming events span the globe and feature topics from translation to company building to deal making and investment. We hope to see you on the road at an upcoming BioCentury event. Visit biocenturyontheroad.com for more information and to register. I'm back with Dr. Richard Pazder, Director of the Oncology Center of Excellence, and uh, he's alone now. His avatar has um, taken a walk. Uh, I, I want to start by asking you, what is the Oncology Center of Excellence? Because I think people in the outside, and even people in the industry who I've spoken with, they think that means that you and your center review all cancer applications, make all decisions about everything having to do with um, cancer at FDA. That isn't quite what it is, is it? Not really. Okay. Uh, the center was set up and there were multiple discussions on how the center should be uh, set up. I obviously had my own idea. Other people's had had their ideas. The current structure is that the center itself has a small cadre of people. Um, myself and the deputies serve in dual positions. Uh, we are, have acting positions within CDER, and for the CDER products, those are the regulatory pathway that the decision is made by our acting positions in uh, CDER. We do not have acting positions in CBER. We have developed uh, what's called our medical oncology review teams, basically, uh, that provide advice and do a, a review of uh, the CBER related products. Uh, and uh, the regulatory sign off for the entire application resides in CBER. We do have sign off on the clinical portion of that application. So it is not as I had envisioned, but it is what it is. And uh, here again, I think that uh, this is still an evolving issue of how the center of excellence, especially if uh, the agency has a desire to have many more uh, needs to evolve and what they will look like. Uh, this is not a process that has been finished. That's, that's interesting because there is, well, there are other centers of excellence, but there also there's, there's constant talk. Every community, every patient community wants a center of excellence for, um, for their disease. I think in part because they, they see what has been accomplished in oncology and they think, well, we, we want some of that too. Well, I think people have to realize that uh, the budget that we have, which is not that great, has been, I think, one of the biggest uh, uh, bargains that the American public has gotten as far as investments on, on expenditures uh, in the agency. When one takes a look at you know, the multitude of programs that we have developed, ranging from uh, the Orbis program, which uh, now has over 500 applications throughout the world that has been approved, um, a project confirm, which is a database for all of our accelerated approvals that is in real time, uh, you know, our call center for uh, uh, for expanded access or single patient INDs, I should say, uh, our work on pragmatic trials, our community outreach programs. Um, all of these have been quite successful and emanate really from a very small staff. Well, I want to ask you about some of those and also ask you about whether you think some of those could or should be expanded um, more broadly within the, within the agency. Um, 
Let's start, well, it isn't really a project, but it's a policy that you've been very um, forceful about, which is multi-regional trials and saying that, you, and, and, and um, FDA has actually rejected um, trials that were conducted solely of, of, of cancer drug that were solely conducted in China because they were solely conducted in China. And I'm wondering, what, what is the, the thinking? What's, why do you believe that multi-regional trials are important or even essential? Are there really differences between the way that people in one country or one ethnic group uh, respond to a cancer drug that make it necessary to, to study things um, as broadly as, as, as you're requiring? Well, I think multi-regional trials is really the industry norm now. So it's not something that I want, basically. But I think the industry, because it is a multinational, all of the multinational companies, the large pharmaceutical companies, are not just serving the FDA. They are serving multiple regulatory agencies. And therefore, every agency wants some element of their country or their people's potentially represented. So I think this is one of the things that uh, has come out. Uh, this really revolves around many issues here. And one of them include the whole concept of equity in clinical trials, representation of minority groups here. Uh, we in the United States have publicly stated that we want representative populations, uh, especially in people that have been heretofore disenfranchised from the clinical trial scene, so to speak. Uh, and by just accepting, uh, you know, uh, clinical trials from a foreign country exclusively done outside of the United States, uh, one will never recognize this. When we talk about equity, Steve, I, I think one of the things that has not been done very well by the agency is really to ask themselves the question, why? Why do we want equity? Why do we want this representation of the U.S. population? And there's three reasons. Number one is what I call a social justice issue. We heard during the social upheaval uh, during the COVID pandemic that people want people that look like them on clinical trials. They want trust in the clinical trials, and that trust will only be attained by really having people that look like them in their clinical trials. So that's one issue, and this is equally important as the other two. The second one is, uh, what are the extrinsic ethnic factors? How does our medical system interplay with a particular drug, the administration of the drug, the handling of the uh, toxicities, the adverse events, the access to drugs to certain minority groups uh, in the United States? Uh, our dietary issues here that may be different, our concomitant medications, other medical procedures that are done in the United States, those are extrinsic issues. Then we get to the, or rather extrinsic issues, then we get to the intrinsic issues of the biology of a particular ethnic or social group that one is dealing with. And that gives us some flexibility here because we can use data from multi-regional trials to look at potential differences in drug metabolism, uh, potential differences in uh, a, a uh, of how somebody's genetics handles a particular drugs or influences it. So we've advocated, uh, and we'll have an upcoming article coming out shortly that I wrote with uh, Rob and uh, Namaji on this, uh, is, you know, this interface between you know, the DAP plans, the diversity action plans and multi-regional trials that they're really not adversely, you know, going at each other, but really they're complementary because some of this information we can get from outside of the United States. And we should be advocating for sites in Central America where uh, a large and uh, again, burgeoning population in the United States is emanating from, uh, as well as Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, uh, and other parts of the world, such as uh, India and the Middle East, which have been very misrepresented or underrepresented. Well, I want to ask you about something else that, that's very specific to oncology, I think, which is the, the emphasis that you've put on dose optimization. And that, um, I think that illustrates also the way that you, you kind of, you're looking at the whole field, right? And you saw a problem. It's not like 
this was something that you you necessarily had to do. You you looked at it, you saw a problem. So can you talk about one, what kind of what, what were the origins of it? And then two, it, is the issue so generalizable? Is it generalizable across um across um cancer, or is it really about specific kinds of cancer drugs, specific areas that you're you're interested in that you believe that this dose optimization needs to be I, I think it's really across uh all all of the drugs that we deal with. Uh uh, and some people do a better job than others. The issues that kind of brought this to the forefront were multiple drugs we had to take off the market because they simply were too toxic, basically, and led to survival decrements, okay? We cannot be in a position of approving drugs unless we have a very clear understanding of what's going on, where the drug uh, that we're going to approve has a inferior survival to a standard therapy. No one in their right mind would say that that's progress, and I could never justify that. So we had a series of drugs. Some of these were the PI3 kinase drugs and the hematological malignancies, but there were other drugs too, uh, where we did notice this. And it really points to a problem that we've had in medical oncology, and I do wanna spend some time on this. One of the concepts that we have in phase two drug development, where we're only looking at response rate, is what is the highest response rate we could get, okay? Let's push that dose. Let's get that highest response rate. So the emphasis is we can't really evaluate toxicity that well in a single arm trial. So let's just push, push, push to get that highest response rate. Well, that's fine, and you'll get the highest response rate. But then what happens when you take it to a phase three trial? You're no longer taking a look at response rate. You're taking a look at a more distal endpoint, that of either overall survival or uh, progression-free survival. And that's an entirely different situation because if you have to do significant dose reductions or dose delays, you may not be able to give effective therapy to influence those more distal endpoints of overall survival. And that is particularly true if your comparator arm is relatively uh, less toxic, okay? So you're going against a drug that has been maximized for its maximal toxicity, okay, that has to have a significant dose reductions, delays, you name it, okay? And you're comparing it to sometimes a drug, in the case of multiple myeloma, it might be daratubumab that's pretty fairly well tolerated, or rituximab. Uh, and you're going to get inferior results when it comes to overall survival because you may not be even able to deliver the drug that you think you should be getting. So I've always used this statement, and I don't want to sound trite because I've used it so much, that, you know, literally if you don't have the right dose of the drug, you're building a house on quicksand and it's just going to crumble in front of you. Uh, and we're doing people a favor and unfortunately, some people don't realize that. <laughs> no, no, they don't. There's, 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 it's something that I've heard criticism from um, in the industry. And I think most of the people who criticize it tell me, well, I can understand why these other drugs need to be, uh, to have this kind of um, rigorous dose finding, but but the kind of drugs that they're working on maybe don't. And, and, and they... here, here, I, I don't want to say that one size fits all in what we would look for in a dose optimization, but the dosing should be carefully discussed with the agency. The days of MTD and let's just blast people with toxicities, I, I think uh, is not, not no longer here, especially when we have other therapies, okay. And, um, and so, when we're gonna have when they're gonna be combination therapies, right? So yes. you're not just dealing with the toxicity. Correct. And, and so it's extremely them. important uh, to get this in. And, and we're not asking anything more that isn't done in other therapeutic areas, okay. Uh, this issue that there's a somebody has a franchise to in, induce or uh, lay on excessive toxicities just because somebody has cancer uh, is a ridiculous argument and it is not a, a, an argument that I would uphold, so to speak. So um, a lot of times it, there are things that you've asked for that, that industry that creates a drug seems to be reluctant to do, or maybe they catch on to it um, later. One of those 
examples, I think, is pragmatic trials. You, you've got a project around pragmatic trials. You've emphasized them. Maybe I've missed it. I haven't seen a lot of, uh, of uptake from that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, I, I guess I'll use another adage. You could uh, bring a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, so to speak. Uh, and I, I just feel very frustrated about this. Uh, we had multiple discussions about pragmatic trials. Uh, we want to see simplification of trials. We want endpoints uh, that are clinically meaningful in these trials, such as overall survival. We want less data collection. This is particularly true for supplemental indications. We're willing to work with sponsors on uh, the size of trials. We really were the uh, motivation for the NCI to do their lung uh, uh, study uh, in uh, Pragmatica. That was an idea I had uh, because we really needed to confirm or not confirm uh, a very preliminary finding. And this was an ideal example because we didn't know any more, need more any safety information on these drugs. We really, really wanted to recapitulate a survival curve. But here again, many times companies are very reluctant to uh, change. A change is hard, okay. Uh, I understand that because they're many times risk averse. The comments that other regulatory agencies will not take this, I beat them to the punch on this. I went to Japan, I went to the EMA, I went to Swiss Medic, we're all on board on this. Uh, and I, we would help facilitate any of these discussions. But here again, I, I can't have a conversation with somebody that's saying, there's too burdensome of a regulatory environment. And then on the other hand, when we're offering them the hand to create less burdensome trials that, uh, that it is completely ignored. One of the other very, I think, emphasis that needs to be done here uh, that we're learning from the lung trial that the NCI is doing. Because of a simple trial, this encourages it to be done in the community, and there's much more of a representative population in terms of underrepresented ethnic groups in, in a trial that is simple. It just makes sense. Uh, the trials are going to accrue faster uh, if the trial is simple, a two-arm design, it's easier for the research nurses and the research personnel to explain to patients. Uh, there's less data that needs to be collected. The patients understand the trial better. Uh, it's a win-win situation. And I would hope with time, uh, we will uh, nudge the industry to accept this more, especially for supplemental indications, which is a fair amount of our work. It's not just new molecular entities, that's for sure. So I, I've got a lot more questions, but we've actually run out of time, but I, I still want to ask you a final one oh, to go over time a little bit. You've got this fantastic vantage point to see everything that's happening in cancer drug development. I think nobody else in the world probably has this ability because you, you see everything from IND, before INDs, all the way through, and you see proprietary data that nobody else can see and, and the agency's analyses and so on. What excites you? For the future, what is what 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 do you think is going to be fascinating when we have this conversation in another five years or twenty five years? I would hope that we see the success of the PD one drugs replicated in the next immunological advance here, and I can't be more specific than that. But uh, I earlier in my career was a complete nihilist on immunotherapy, but with the advent, obviously, of the CAR T cells and the PD-1 drugs, the checkpoint inhibitors, I really embrace this. And I would hope that the success, and here again, we have one drug that has almost 40, I think, approvals, you know, 14 of these drugs out there that we will see, you know, the diseases that have been uh, you know, uh, basically marginal therapies for really been transformed with these drugs being used in neoadjuvant and earlier disease settings that have offered cure to patients. So I would hope that we could build on that with, and I don't know what that next advance is going to be. 
We've also learned some lessons here too. And you know, we've written about this extensively in the Wild West of checkpoint inhibitors. Do we need 14 of the same drug on the market? Uh, and are we really taking resources away? Uh, the issue is one of, and I fully understand it, of competition among these companies, but there also has to be a degree of collaboration. And this also came up with the, the uh, I would just say a messy situation involving how we determine a PD-1 status and the various companies having different methodologies to determine that. And despite our attempts to try to address this, again, uh, our, uh, our voices were not heard. Well, and that, that's something where I can tell readers if they want to know about that, they should read my colleague Lauren Martz's um, story about that. She she covered the ODAC meeting about that in depth, and it was really um, important and impactful. Thanks very much, Dr. Pazder. Unfortunately, um, we have gone over time, but I really appreciate all, all of your thoughts and, and, and your 25 years of service. Um, and Steve, <laughs> not only 25 years uh, as a, a uh, FDA employee, it's my 45th anniversary as a medical oncologist. So I have seen so much that has and, happened in this field and really the growth of a field from a discipline that very few people wanted to go into, into one that is one of the more popular medical specialties and one that had the pharmaceutical companies have devoted almost 40% of their budgets to in some years. BioCentury would like to thank Cytiva for supporting the BioCentury show. To gain more insights into therapeutic advances and biopharma sustainability, read the report now, available on Cytiva.com. Kendall Square Orchestra provides the music for the BioCentury show. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education.